Real Virginia is produced by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Farming, it's all good. Visit our website at vafarmbureau.org. Chesapeake Bay, Atlantic to Appalachia, home in my heart always. Hello everyone and welcome to Real Virginia, a show about Virginia agriculture and the people who produce all of the wonderful products we enjoy. What are feral hogs doing in Virginia and what problems are they causing for agriculture? Even the smallest gardener can enjoy raising cut flowers and technology continues to play a growing role in agriculture. Welcome back everyone. On this glorious summer day, we're in central Virginia on a grain and vegetable farm. And now we're gonna go out in the field with Dave Miller. He's gonna explain the problem that we're seeing in rural Virginia with the growing feral hog population. Virginia is on the front lines of the northward spread of feral hogs. There are 29 to 30 areas we know feral hogs exist. Hog populations have soared out of control in many states to our south, causing damage to agriculture, forestry, and private and public land ecology. Those of us on our feral hog committee here in Virginia refer to feral hogs as four-legged ecological disasters. There's probably nothing else on the landscape, uh, living animal, in Virginia or in the United States for that matter that are just as destructive as, as feral hogs are. So frequently when we're down here at Falls Cape State Park we run into old or fresh rooting activity and here along this road you can see where hogs have recently rooted up um, along the road edge like I say they're looking for grubs, insects, worms, um, things like that. Um, if we continue along um, You'll likely find more um, in here. You'll actually see where they've gone through here. And it just looks like something has just taken a broom and just kind of pushed everything around. Um, and these, these areas become um, laden with bacteria from uh, the droppings in urine of hogs. Um, in high water events and areas that are highly erodible, this can become uh, more of an area prone to erosion. Uh, and it can create problems. Farmers in Halifax, Orange, and Culpeper counties reported losses due to hog damage in excess of $10,000 to their corn crops. Corral traps are best to handle this problem. Box traps that catch a single animal work, but they also serve as a warning lesson to other animals of the group, causing them to move on. Trail cameras can be used to see how many animals are entering the corral trap with the goal of catching the entire sounder or group at the same time. And right now behind me, we, we know we have six that are, are utilizing this site and have been for about a month. And we hope to uh, be on site next week if, if weather um, conditions favor it. And we would like to drop this door on all six and know we got this whole group um, as opposed to catching three or four and the other two going, you know, who knows where. We know we have uh, at least two very large sows in this group. Um, they look obviously pregnant. Um, you can see uh, teats on the females. Uh, we also know we have a couple of large boars. We also know we have a smaller boar. Um, so uh, what we, we want to do is sit here and wait till we see all six and then we're going to drop the door. And when the hogs come in, they can either trap themselves um, with a manual trigger or we can sit in the woods and actually set this door to go off um, by remote control. Proctor says farmers often suffer the most damage from an active herd of feral hogs. Hogs rooting in pastures and fields can cause farm animals to injure themselves in the ruts and can spread disease. Their ruts often cause damage to farm vehicles and make it difficult to cultivate and plant crops. What we're telling Virginians right now is that if you care anything about the environment, natural resources, or wildlife in general, you do not want feral hogs on your property or around you, period. Virginia game officials have been aggressively trapping and eradicating feral hogs for several years, but it takes only one fertile mating pair for the population to rebound. They can produce 18 piglets a year. From False Cape State Park, this is Dave Miller reporting.
The seashore and agriculture aren't mentioned often in the same sentence, unless you're a resident of Virginia's largest city, Virginia Beach, where there's a thriving farm economy. The 187 farms in Virginia Beach have more than 20,000 acres of cropland, where farmers raise corn, wheat, soybeans, hay, and fresh fruits and vegetables. Beef cattle, commercial hogs, and broiler chickens are also raised here. And there are many pick-your-own operations close by one of Virginia's largest population centers. Altogether, agriculture contributes $17.7 million to the economy of Virginia Beach, Virginia. Hi, I'm Chris Mullins. Today we're going to talk about cut flowers from the ground up. Please stay tuned. The farm has been in the family for 134 years. This has been my home. It's the only thing I've known. Growing up on a dairy farm was great. You've got all the opportunities to have fun in the wide open spaces and enjoy working with the crops and the cattle and it was a good way of growing up. I really enjoyed it. I believe that the family farm is important in this country no matter if it's 50 cows or 5,000 cows. A lot of the family farms consume their own products and they realize the importance of having a good healthy product. I am proud that our family and all of us here at this farm at Walk Up can be involved in producing nutritious milk for the society. I'm Dan Myers, a fifth generation dairy farmer from Virginia. I am dedicated to dairy, my cows, my milk, and my land. Are you looking to grow cut flowers in your own garden? Our garden expert, Chris Mullins, shows us how from the ground up. Hi, I'm Chris Mullins. Today we're at Virginia State University's Randolph Farm. And uh, behind us you can see lots of plants growing, lots of vegetable plants and things like that. And that's what we normally talk about on this show. But today we're going to change gears a little bit. We're going to talk about cut flowers. You know, when you go out and you buy a nice arrangement of flowers, you put it on the table, it makes everybody feel good, but it can be a little expensive. So what about, uh, what if you had your own flowers that you could cut? What about within your vegetable garden, you grow some nice cut flowers like zinnias or sunflowers or things like that that you can go out and cut, bring in, put it on the kitchen table and make everybody feel nice. Uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about that, uh, so let's go see what we've got. Well today we've got Susan Cheek with us and she's a farm management agent with the Small Farm and Technical Outreach Program here at Virginia State. Not only does she work with farmers though, she's also a florist and she grows cut flowers. So we're, we're really glad you could be with us, with us today. Thank you Susan. Um, as gardeners are thinking about all the vegetables they can grow, maybe they haven't thought about cut flowers. What are some good cut flowers that they can grow in their garden space? Uh, sunflowers, zinnias, cosmos, status are all very easy flowers. So those are things that they can grow uh, pretty easy to go from maybe from seed on most of those. Uh, I see you've got some some sunflowers here. Let's let's look at those. What do they uh, what do they look like? Um, this is your average arrangement from the grocery store. Okay. Uh, about ten dollars, fifteen dollars if you went to the florist, possibly as high as twenty for this. Wow, for that. Okay. Well, that's that's pretty expensive, and I, I would imagine that you've got let's see, you've got one, two, three, four, five sunflowers in there. Um, you could grow those yourself, couldn't you? Oh yeah. And they're I noticed they're different colors. Are there lots of different varieties of sunflowers out um, there? You can grow whites, yellows. There's some reds, burgundies. Okay. Nice range of sizes. You can get them with or without pollen, so it doesn't get on your clothes. So the pollen you can get varieties that don't have pollen. So when you put them on your table, you don't have all that pollen falling all over your table. Yeah. Oh, that's great. And, uh, and they all get pretty tall usually, right? Or there's some there's short ones? There's more varieties that are smaller. Okay. And then like you, you mentioned zinnias and some snapdragons. So there's other kinds of things that, that you can grow uh, in and amongst your, uh, your vegetables. Yeah, no problem. They help with your beneficials and bring in butterflies and bees and birds to help pollinate the other plants as well. Okay. Well, um, how hard are these to plant from uh, seed? These are very easy from seed. You direct seed them right into the ground, two to four times the size of the seed, cover them up with soil and water. Let's, let's plant some and see how it goes. All right, well, we've got some sunflower seeds here. These were donated, these packs, from Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. And each of these packs has about 100 or so seeds in it. How much would these cost? Uh, between 2 and $4 on average. Okay, so not too much. Um, here we've got a sunflower variety. Let's, let's show us how to plant that. So we're just going to open them and you're going to go about two to four times the size of the seed and pretty much about eight to ten inches apart. All right, well this has been freshly tilled up. Let me, let me go ahead and level it off and make us a good seed bed. 
All right, and so what are you going to be doing with that again? So you're just going to poke a hole in the ground where you want to put your seed. Okay. And this will work even in like a kid's sand bucket if you want to grow them on your porch or patio. And then you just cover them up, and what you're going to do is come back later and water. Now how far apart are you putting these? You want to go about 6 to 8 inches, some varieties 12 to 14, depending on if it's a larger or a smaller variety. Sunflower, these are a little bit smaller varieties, so you don't need them as far apart. Okay, so about uh, two for every foot or so. And if you want to put two seeds to make sure that they come up good, then you can thin them out as they come up where you can see the plants. Okay, okay. And now I notice, you know, we talked about zinnias before too, and we've got some zinnias here, about the same cost for those. And uh, let's see, we saw the, the size of the sunflower seeds. These are going to be pretty similar. Uh, let's look at those. Pretty similar in size. And uh, we're going to plant those in a similar manner, right? Right. They're okay. going to get a little larger because they branch and they bush out. And then when they get mm, probably about two foot, you want to pinch off the top buds so that they'll branch out further and you get more flowers. Okay. And once you have the flowers, you can cut them about two to three times a week on some varieties. Okay. So all this planting is not too difficult, real similar to everything else. Um, now, let's just say that somebody is trying this in their home garden. They've got their sunflowers or zinnias are growing. What do they do next? How, how do they cut these to make them nice so they can take them inside and put them in an arrangement? Um, cut the length of stem you want. You can go as close to the base of the plant as you want, depending on the length. And obviously with the zinnias, you want to keep cutting them so you want to go to where there's leaves that come together and cut down at the branch. Okay. So it'll keep pushing out new blooms. Okay. Okay. Um, then you're going to cut them at an angle. When you cut them, you don't want to smush the stem because then it won't take water. Uh, okay, so don't smush the stem. Right. Is there anything that somebody would put these in to make them last longer? Um, you could get Floralife from a local florist or grocery store. You could add a little bit of sugar or aspirin as just a home option. Okay. You want to recut them every couple of days to keep them fresh as long as possible. Um, when you're cutting the sunflowers, you don't want them all the way open. Okay, okay. Well, great. Thanks again for being with us here today. This is really, uh, it seems pretty easy. I think anybody could do this. And uh, I'm glad and hopefully uh, you'll be able to do, uh, do this in your home garden. And for more information about growing cut flowers in the, in the home garden, please contact your local uh, Cooperative Extension office. For From the Ground Up, I'm Chris Mullins and we'll see you next time. Up next, Carissa Jackson takes us into the heart of the home to prepare a zesty pasta salad full of garden fresh vegetables just in time for summer cookouts. Stay with us. wildfires. We're in the prime of summer party season and if you're looking for a terrific cold pasta dish featuring shrimp, tomatoes and cucumbers, Miss America 2010 Carissa Jackson has just the recipe for you in the heart of the home. Hi, I'm Carissa Jackson and welcome to Heart of the Home. Today I'll be cooking from the kitchen at Meadow Hall at the Meadow Event Park. Today we're going to be making a shrimp summer pasta salad. This is a great way to get lots of fruits and vegetables in, as well as lighten it up a bit, especially for dinner time. You don't want to be in the kitchen for a really long time cooking an extremely hot meal. This is also something that's great that you can take to a family reunion or a summer barbecue. In this recipe, almost anything goes when it comes to fruits and vegetables. So the first thing we're going to do is boil our noodles. I'll be using about three cups of bow tie noodles. Right, and we're gonna add a little salt to our water just for flavor. A friend of mine who went on a swamp tour told me that you could add some vinegar to the water and that actually helps it not to stick. I haven't tried it yet, so somebody try it and let me know if it works. We're gonna bring this to a boil for about 10 minutes. But before we break for that, you can go and get yourself some already pre-cooked shrimp that have been peeled, um, that may still have the tail on or not. I've chosen to take the tails off of mine. And what we're gonna do is toss it in about three tablespoons of Obey seasoning. Now 
Now that may seem like a lot, but what you have to realize is we're going to eventually add this to the whole salad. And so this seasoning on these shrimps will then um, suffice as the seasoning for the rest of the pasta salad. We will then set these to the side and move over to our cutting board. Today I have chosen cherry tomatoes and fresh cucumbers. Though you can add asparagus, you can add broccoli, almost anything you want. If you're gonna add something like asparagus or broccoli, then I would say add those to your boil where the noodles are for about the last three minutes of boil. So let's start with the cucumber. I have taken off both of the ends just for easier slicing. And we're gonna slice it right down the middle. Lay our halves down, slice them down the middle again. And then chop into very fine pieces. So this would be considered a cucumber in fourths. Alright, set these off in a bowl. And I've already started to cut some of my cherry tomatoes in half, as you can see. And we want about a cup of cherry tomatoes. So now that our fresh vegetables are done, our shrimp has been mixed. We'll just wait for our pasta salad and then it'll be time to mix everything together. I have drained my noodles and I have rinsed them off in a cold bath and we're now going to go ahead and add them to a large mixing bowl. Next we will add in our cucumbers. Our cherry tomatoes. And then our seasoned shrimp. We want to mix this up just so it's distributed evenly. You can also add some fresh carrots to this, whatever you have in the refrigerator. And I know earlier I mentioned fruits and veggies, but one of the things that you'd be surprised to know, some of you, is that tomatoes are actually considered a fruit. So I wouldn't advise you going and putting grapes or oranges or anything like this in this kind of salad, but almost any vegetable goes. And as you can see, like I told you earlier, the Obey seasoning has now redistributed itself throughout the salad. We will then add one cup of our favorite Italian dressing and a couple of handfuls of oregano. Once it's all mixed together, you can either add it to the refrigerator for some time to cool, or you can serve it immediately. By rinsing it off in the cool bath, it then makes your noodles cold enough to serve fresh from out of the bowl. And here you have a fresh summer shrimp and pasta salad. I'm Caressa Jackson for Heart of the Home. Come and get it. Recipes from the heart of the home can be found on the Virginia Farm Bureau website at vafarmbureau.org. Sales of farm products reached record highs in 2012, both in Virginia and the U.S., according to the 2012 Census of Agriculture. The market value of Virginia agriculture products sold is now $3.75 billion. That's up 29% from 2007. According to the census, Virginia has 46,030 farms, almost 3% less than five years before. The 2012 report shows the value of Virginia ag products sold to consumers was almost $42 million. That's up from $29 million in 2007. Technology is playing a huge role in our daily lives, and this includes on the farm. As Wes Jones tells us from WVPT in Harrisonburg, these new tools are making a big difference for farmers. Agriculture is an age-old industry, but today, farmers everywhere are using new technology and innovation 
to increase their yields and better manage their fields. Here on Fox Run Farms, Ian Heatwell has been using auto guidance on his tractor and combine for a number of years. We let the computer do the job of me turning the steering wheel. Uh, it can, it, using GPS satellites, it, the machine knows where it is, it knows what equipment you're pulling behind it and where it needs to be on the next pass, and so uh, it does the job of, of keeping you online and, and going where you need to go. He also uses yield monitors that create a real-time map of how his field is performing. It measures moisture content, how much has been harvested, and how much is left. But Heatwell says that hardware is only half of the system. Every time this GPS equipment is out in the field doing something, it's recording what it's doing, where it's doing it. And so the other half of the system is taking that information and using it to change your management for each particular field or even subset, sub areas in the field. So we can see what we're doing, how it impacted each area of the field and, and change our management accordingly. And it was trying to get to that, that point. Drones, GoPro cameras, and farms don't normally go together. But Timothy Woodward of TELUS Agronomics is changing the way producers get information about their crops. He uses cameras and drones to help farmers with field management. We deal just with producers uh, in the fields of soil fertility, precision agriculture, uh, crop scouting, data summarization, many things. Woodward says having pictures of field areas that are stressed will ultimately help farmers to save steps. We know exactly where to go to look to see why it's bad and basically bypass the areas that are good that really don't need our attention. There are uh, application rates at the same time, so the less amount of uh, uh, stuff you're putting on the ground, if you put it where it's needed, that means you don't have to put it where it's not, you're saving some money, and that's less stuff that might run off, so it's also helping the environment a little bit at the same time. The drones are equipped with more than just cameras. Infrared sensors can monitor individual crops to assess their growth. It is actually sensing how the sun ref reflects and refracts. It goes through that photosynthesis process of that green leaf plant. And scientists and academia, they've all got all these indices and they say, well, if, it's look if it looks this color in that near infrared band, then that means your plant is stressed or it's got low nitrogen or the phosphorus is too high, it's too wet, it's too dry. Um, so you can tell what the stress levels are and you can actually say what the stress levels are. So the whole purpose of getting that imagery is just to define what's going on in each individual plant. And uh, right now we get down to actually every three centimeters we can give you data. Future technology is already being used by farmers today. And more than anything, it's making their jobs a little bit easier. It allows us to be better stewards of the land that, that we're farming. Uh, and it does that by making our job somewhat easier to take the information that we were generating before and use it somewhat uh, effectively. Uh, before we could, we could do these things, but it was very difficult because all your records are keeping on little slips of paper in the tractor or whatever, and then you had to gather them up and, and, and analyze the data that way. Now we're recording the data automatically. We don't have to do anything to get the data. We just have to analyze it. In Augusta County, I'm Wes Jones. That's going to do it for this edition of Real Virginia. We are so glad you could join us to celebrate the bounty Virginia has to offer. Whether it's in your home, your garden, or your landscape, we're proud to say that this is Real Virginia. So for everyone from the Virginia Farm Bureau, thanks for watching. Make it a good week. Chesapeake Bay.